So as we continue our series on knowing spiritual warfare, tonight we'll be covering the next two pieces of armament. We have covered a lot of ground, I feel like, and are about at the halfway point tonight. So I think it's going to be a total of six, uh, six lessons. Uh, tonight is lesson number three. I believe I'll have at least two more, maybe three at most, um, in our series. So tonight, is, I believe, is about our halfway point. Um, last week, we covered the belt of truth and why it's so important to understand why it's the first piece of equipment that is listed. Because everything is based on what we know, and we need to know the truth. So everything is based upon the belt of truth. If we don't have the belt of truth, then the rest of the armor really doesn't mean much because we have nothing to hinge it upon. We have nothing to go back to and to refer it to because everything comes from the truth because we understand that Jesus is what? The way, the truth, and the life. So without God within us, we don't have truth to begin with. So everything, every piece of armament, everything in spiritual warfare will always be linked to Jesus and will be linked to his spirit inside of us. So every armament that we've covered so far has always had a way of linking back or going back to the belt of truth. We cover the breastplate of righteousness and learn that true righteousness can only come from God and that righteousness is the standard which God sets for us. So righteousness is the standard of which God says to do things and not to do things. It is his way of saying this is right and this is wrong. And once again, that's why it's linked to the belt of truth. Because if we don't truly believe that what he's saying is true, then we won't do it because it won't matter to us because it is not true to us. So we understand that that's what righteousness is. We also learn that if we are not living up to the standard which God has placed upon us, and, and based upon the truth that's in his word, which he is the word, then we are being what people like to call unrighteous. And God cannot work through unrighteousness. If we are not righteous, then God cannot use us in the, um, in the way that he would like to. He can still work in a way through us, but he cannot use us the way he has. We won't be used to our full potential unless we are in righteousness, unless we have the breastplate of righteousness placed upon us. So those are the two things that we touched last week. And of course, the week before that, we just touched on knowing spiritual warfare, what exactly it is, how to recognize it, how to recognize our enemy and, and how exactly how he comes at us and attacks us. So like I said, tonight we're going to be moving on to the next two pieces of armament. Ephesians 6, 13 through 16 tonight is where we're going to be kind of staying at. So Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 16 says this. It says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now remember that we are still talking about spiritual warfare tonight. We are still involved in that. So whenever you hear of these armaments, it's still all linked to spiritual warfare. Don't ever think that, well, this piece doesn't relate because it does, has nothing to do with it. No, everything that we're talking about in this series has something to do with spiritual warfare. It is a way either it's going to protect us from it or, as we'll learn in a little bit uh, on down in the next lesson, we have things that we'll also attack with. So we learn that everything we're learning has to do with spiritual warfare. The very first verse that we were reading talks a lot about standing. It says that we should withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So we see that the word of God talks a lot about standing and being firm upon the word of God, being firm where we are. So whenever you are think about standing or talk about standing, what do you stand upon? Your feet. Your feet is the most important thing when you talk about standing. You think about having sure footing. Because whenever something is coming at you, you normally try to brace yourself by having good footing. You always know when someone's in a stance to defend themselves by the placement of their feet. 
You don't stand straight up if someone's coming at you because you're going to get knocked over pretty easy. You shift your weight to be able to take the hit or to be able to go. You move your feet and you shift with it. So your feet and the placement of your feet and the things you have on your feet is so important to when you are in battle and when you are fighting and when you're engaging in spiritual warfare. So if you think about feet, you will obviously think about the shoes that are placed upon your feet. And if you think about today, we have shoes for everything. We have dress shoes. We have church shoes. We have running shoes, walking shoes, house shoes, dance shoes, work shoes. We have all these different types of shoes, tennis shoes. We have cowboy shoes. We got all these different shoes that you can think of and put on. You think of shoes. So whenever Paul was talking about the armor of God, he, of course, was referring to the armor that the Romans was wearing at that time. So if you look back and you study it and you really look up the type of shoes that the Romans were using in battle and the things that they fought with, their feet or their sandals they actually had was footed or it had cleats on the bottom of their shoes. Many of y'all may have known that. Some of y'all may not have. I didn't know. And so I looked it up. I started researching it and looking. They actually had metal cleats on the bottom of their sandals when they were going into battle. And the reason why, if you know anything about shoes, and especially if you watch sports, whether it's football, baseball, or soccer, they wear cleats to get better footing. You're able to run better. You're able to make quick turns. You're, you have more traction on your feet because of the cleats that they grab to the ground. They dig your feet in. So whenever you look at it that way, the Romans, whenever they fought, they would dig their feet in with the cleats and be able to have better footing. So if you refer to that into the armor of God, it talks about having the shoes with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You relate that to the cleats or the shoes that they wore that help them maintain their position and help them maintain their sure footedness. So whenever you say you plant your feet in the ground, that's what it's talking about. The shoes you have on is what's going to help you plant your feet to where you are and you're not going to be able to move. You're not going to be able to be shifted very easily because your feet are well planted in the ground. So it's the same way whenever we're reading about the armor of God. It says that we should have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So what exactly is this trying to tell us? Well, let's see. Because it's very important that we understand that this because without it we would not be able to stand firm without the proper footing without the proper shoes on our feet we will not stand firm we will not be able to withstand the enemy in the evil day that he comes up against us see you can you can have the belt of truth on and the bless, and the breastplate of righteousness but if you have bare feet then how much traction do you really think you're going to have so you can put your belt of truth on, you can put your breastplate of righteousness on, you can have that, you can know it. But if you do not have true peace in your life, how much true traction and footing do you think you're going to have against the enemy? I mean, have you ever tried to stop someone from pushing you around when you're barefoot? I know kids, I know me, our children, they play outside all the time barefoot. That's... That's just their thing. We tell them 20 times to put their shoes on. I go outside, sure enough, their socks are over here, their shoes are over there, and they're way over there. And we, I try to tell them, put your shoes on. Because if you realize, especially my son, whenever you put socks on him in the house, he's like, look at me skate. And he'll slide all around the house in his socks. He's like, ooh, I can skate. And then he'll do like the fake falls, like, whoo, <laughs> hit the ground. I'm like, son, just walk, man. And he's like, pull up my socks. So if you look at it in that, pro, in that aspect, it's so important for us to understand why we have to have the proper foot gear on. Because if not, we're not going to have the traction to be able to truly stand where we need to stand. We're not going to have those cleats upon our feet to truly plant our feet in the Word of God and plant our feet right where God has put us. Because if we do not have peace, then we will move because we don't have the proper traction on our feet. So let's see what these shoes are all about that is supposed to give us a sure foundation. So the first thing we must realize is that it says the gospel, the gospel of peace, right? So what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. It's what it is. If you look up the definition in Greek, the word gospel is used very 
or should I say not used very much in the New Testament because the word gospel was used in a way that it almost matched the sermon I preached, uh, I think Sunday, where it says it's too good to be true. So whenever you hear the word gospel in the New Testament, that's what it's referring to. It's something that's just too good to be true. So whenever you hear the good news, it's too good for us to be true. But the, the good news, of course, is Jesus coming to earth to be the sacrifice for our sins. So that's what the good news is. It's sharing who and what Jesus has done for us. So it gives us hope for eternity. One translation reads it this way. Ephesians 6 and 15 in the NLT. It says, For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. So put on the shoes that comes from the good news. It comes from the gospel. It comes from Jesus. It comes from the word of God. So whenever you look at it that way and you're putting it on and it comes from the good news, which is the plan of salvation, then we understand that we're able to stand upon that and we know that everything comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The plan of salvation, though, is just the first step in true salvation. So salvation doesn't stop at Acts 2.38. We don't read, well, then we get baptized in the Holy Ghost and we all get called to heaven. No, salvation is a lifetime process. Salvation is not just a one-time thing. It's a lifetime. It's a, it's a life thing that we have to live through. So whenever we see that true salvation is a lifetime thing, then we understand that the good news, which is the preparation of the gospel, is the shod our feet with peace. Says now I'm not trying to get too deep in that rabbit hole, but I just we just got to realize that um, we just have to realize that salvation is not the end of it. Salvation it doesn't stop there just because we get the Holy Ghost. That's why we're talking about spiritual warfare because once you get the Holy Ghost, that's when you're truly begin to engage in spiritual warfare. Like I told you in the first lesson, whenever you don't have the Holy Ghost, the enemy's not worried about you because you're sitting on his sidelines on the bench, not even in the game because he's not worried about you because you're over here. But once you leave his side of the field and you go over here and you get salvation, you get uh, filled with the Holy Ghost, then he realizes that now you're against him and you're not for him. So it pretty much puts a crosshair on your back. So that's why I say salvation doesn't end there. So whenever you see this, you realize that you are now engaged in spiritual warfare. That's when the true warfare begins is when you get salvation put into you. With all that being said, you might be thinking, well, how in the world am I supposed to have peace in the middle of a war? Whoa, we're in warfare at all time, right? That's what I say. 24-7, no matter whether you're sleeping or you're awake, you are in spiritual warfare at all times. There's not any time he rests, nor does he stop from trying to engage with you in spiritual warfare. So am I supposed to be at peace whenever I have a target on my head from the enemy? And he will not stop at anything to try and take my soul back? If you notice, whenever, you, whenever I was overseas in Afghanistan, it wasn't a very peaceful time. If you notice, high tensions are there. People are always on guard. People are always there. You have posts that are on 24-7. They're watching. They're waiting for the enemy to come. They're always there. But for some reason, you have somewhat of a sense of peace about that because you know someone is watching over you. You know someone has you and is protecting you. So in that, you have some type of peace. Well, that's why it says that you have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's saying that because you have the good news and you should be at peace because you already know the ending of the story. You know God is protecting you. You know that you have God on your side. So that alone should give you peace. That alone should get you to the point to where you're like, okay, you know what? No matter what's going on around me, no matter what's happening, I have God on my side and that's all that I need. So it should give you some sense of peace knowing that you have God fighting for you and is helping you through your trials and your tribulations. So you should be able to have some type of peace about that. Now the reason I feel as the shoes of the piece of the armor is that is peace is because whenever someone is scared or worried, they get what? Weak in the knees, right? They're scared. Their knees begin to knock. They all, the cartoons, right? You see them like, knocking together. They don't have sure footing. Someone's scared. They're ready to run. 
They're always like, they hear noise and they're gone. You get the skittish person, right? So that's why I feel like he tells you that, that your feet have to be peaceful because you've got to be able to stand. You can't be scared. You can't be worried. You can't be ready to run at every time the enemy comes against you. You've got to be able to be at peace knowing that God is protecting you through all of this. Because if you're worried, then you're going to run at every chance. You're going to retreat instead of engage. You're not going to be sure of where you are. You're not going to have sure-footedness, but you're going to try to get away from it at every chance you can because you are not at peace with where you are. If you just go back with me a moment from the early grade schools, who here ever played Red Rover? Right? Red Rover, I love that game. It was a fun game for me. Because the, you would have you know, your team over here lined up and they'll all be holding hands. The team over there would be all lined up holding hands. And whenever they say, Red Rover, Red Rover, send Nathan over. You get ready. You're like, okay, i got to sprint and try to break the arms apart, right? And you always, there's two people you always aim for. The weakest one, the smallest kid, or the one that's scared. And the reason why is because when you're running at them, they get scared. So either they're going to break the hand and you're going to run through, or you're just going to plow them through because they're weak. It's the same way with us. Whenever we have our feet shod with peace, we're not scared. We're not worried. The enemy can come right at us and we're standing there because we know that God is on our side. We know that God is our big brother and he's holding us and we're going to be okay no matter how fast he's coming at us. So whenever you look at it that way, whenever you have your feet shod with peace, you're not that scared kid at Red Rover that everyone's aiming at. No, more or less they're going to steer away from you because they know that you're not going to move no matter what comes your way. If the enemy can get you to be scared and worried, then he knows that you are the weak link in the chain. He knows that he can break through and take you down. And all of a sudden now you're on the on the trying to recover yourself on spiritual warfare. Instead of engaging on the attack, you're still trying to get back to your feet because you wasn't truly at peace with God. John 16 and 33 says this. John 16, 33 says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples and telling them that they should have peace inside him. They'll get their peace from him. He's like, I will be your peace. Not in this world. Because he knew that tribulations would come. He said, many are the tribulations, or many are the afflictions of the righteous, but I will make a way out of each one of them. So he knows that why, as long as we're in this world, because I told you, we're not on our playing field, right? We don't have home field advantage. We're on the enemy's playing field right now. He's at home right now because this is where he got kicked to. And this is where he's trying to tear us down before we go to eternity. Because he knows once we die, it's too late. If we're serving God and we die, it's too late. He didn't get us. But he knows he can get us still here. So we are on his playing field. So God knows that we're going to have tribulations in this world. But he said, don't worry about that. I've already overcome the world. So if you have the gospel inside of you, you know that he's already overcome the world. So you're able to have peace that links to what? The truth of knowing that God has already overcome the world. So like I said, everything links back to that belt because that's the first piece you've got to put on because you've got to know the truth. You've got to understand that because everything stems from it. So in that alone, we should be able to have peace knowing that if we are with God, we will overcome the tribulation of the world because he already has. He said, I'm, David said, well, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread, Right. So we know that the righteous is always going to be taken care of. There's a breastplate of righteousness, right? So if we have that and we have the truth, then we know that God is going to take care of us because we believe in the truth. We have righteousness. And now we're able to stand in peace knowing that he's going to take care of me because I am his righteousness. Amen. So with that, our feet are now shod with peace. We're able to stand. The thing I love about this scripture is that it plainly tells us that we shouldn't put our trust in this world. Say, so don't do it. Don't do it. Because there is tribulations here. 
The world can give you peace, but it's peace that works from the outside in. It's fabricated peace. So you go to a counselor, you go to a doctor, you tell them this, that, and the other. They prescribe you pills. They give you drugs saying, here, if you take this, then you will feel better. You'll have peace in your life. So it's an outside element that you take and put into your body to give you peace. So the world will only give you peace from the outside in and not the inside out like the Spirit of God will. So this world will only fabricate it. It will only make it seem like you're at peace. But guess what? You read the back of the thing, take every four hours. Take one every with every meal. Take one in the morning, one in the evening. So you have to continuously get this and to get your peace. Oh, take this to be able to sleep at night because I can't sleep. Well, if you have the peace of God, you don't have to take this pill in order to get peace because you already have peace inside of you. So you don't have the fabricated peace that the world gives you from the outside trying to make the inside peaceful when it's not peaceful. If your inside's not peaceful, your outside is not going to be. You could fake it, but in this type of world, you can't fake it to make it. It doesn't work in the spiritual realm. There's no faking the making in the spiritual realm. You can't do that. So something that is outside of the body going into the body to give you peace. John 14, 26 and 27. John 14, 26 and 27 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. God said, I will give you my spirit, and with all of that comes peace. So God works from the inside out to give you real peace. See, everything from God works from here out. Everything. Because you have to first get his spirit in order for all of this else to come to fruition. You can't have truth without his spirit inside of you. You can't have righteousness without his spirit. Otherwise, it's self-righteousness. And you definitely cannot have peace in your life without the spirit of peace being inside of you. Scripture said that he's what? The prince of peace. So if you don't have God, the true God, if you don't are not truly filled with his spirit, then peace, righteousness, and truth won't ever be a part of you. It'll be all fabrications. It'll be all fake. It'll all be what the world tells you is right. And God says, don't put your trust in the world because I will give you what it is that you need. Real peace can only come from the inside. Otherwise, it's not real. It's fabricated. Once you have peace inside, the outside just molds to it. You can tell when someone's in peace. You can tell when someone's genuinely happy. Because it's always there. It just glows. They just, they just radiate happiness. They're like, oh man, you're just a happy person. I like being around you. And then you got other people that you're just like, oh. You know, not so much radiant there because they don't have the spirit of peace truly inside of them the way they should. Isaiah 26 and 3. Isaiah 26 and 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. 2 Thessalonians 3 and 16. 2 Thessalonians 3 and 16. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. So with God inside each and every one of us, we should always have peace. Now, am I saying that we won't get frustrated and upset? No, we're going to get upset sometimes. We're going to get frustrated because we're still human. We're still flesh. The Bible even says it, be angry and sin not. So he already knows that, hey, we're going to be angry. We're going to get frustrated. We're going to stump our toe sometimes. We're going to hit our finger with the nail sometimes. We're going to do these things. We're going to get upset. We're going to get frustrated. People are going to get on our nerves. I know, it's a miracle, right? So we understand that we are still humans and we will get upset. We have emotions. We deal with emotions. We're an emotional creature. That's what we run off of 90% of the time is emotions. 
So it doesn't mean, though, that we shouldn't be the ones that try to bring peace into every situation. Yes, we get upset. Yes, we get frustrated. But we should always be the ones that try our best to seek peace with everybody. We might be mad at them. We might be angry at them. We may spout off at them. We may allow our flesh to rise up at moments. But we should be one of the very first ones to go back to that person and say, Hey, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I'm I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to cause this rift between us. So please forgive me. You don't believe me? Hebrews 12 and 14 says, Pursue peace with all men. And the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. If you're not pursuing peace with every man, you're you're most likely not going to see the Lord. Because He tells you to pursue peace with all men. And the sanctification without which no one will see me. Romans 12 and 18 says, If possible... So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. As it depends on you, be at peace with all men. With these scriptures telling us that we should be the peacemakers, it just doesn't make sense all the time. I get it. It's hard. I understand it's hard to be the peacekeeper and the peacemaker in the the home or in the world. I get that. So you're telling me that no matter what, I should do my best to be at peace with everyone? Yes. That's exactly what I'm telling you. No matter what is going on around us or to us, we should try our best to be peaceful. We should try our best. Are we going to fail? Yes, we will fail sometimes. And that's okay. People always tell you, I've always been told, as long as you give me your best, I'll be happy. As long as you tell me I gave it my all, I'm happy. People tell, oh, give 110%. Well, you can't because at 100%, you're out. There's no extra 10% to give. To me, that's one of the most hypocritical things for people to say. Give 110%. How am I supposed to give 110% when 100% is all that I have? So I tell people, just give me everything. If you give me all that you have, I'm happy with that. Because that means you truly try to the best of your ability because not everyone can do everything. So if you are not very good at being peaceful, try. Do your best to be peaceful with what you can. And where you fall short, God will take you the rest of the way if you allow him to. If you allow his spirit to truly work inside of you the way us believers should be, Peace is going to eventually just become a natural occurrence for you. And you will just be want to be peaceful with everyone because you don't like drama. I can't stand drama. I don't like dealing with it. If you're going to be a drama person, just please leave me out of that loop. I don't mind you talking to me. I'll listen to you and I'll talk to you. I'll give you advice back. But I don't want to be involved in the drama because I like peace. I like being able to lay my head at, at... And you can tell my wife, I'm out like that. It don't take me long to go to sleep because I'm at peace. Once I hit that pillow, I'm at peace until my alarm goes off. Philippians 4 and 7 says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's the peace that passes all understanding because without Jesus being with us, we will never be able to be the peacemakers. That's why it's, it surpasses our understanding. How, how can you be peaceful in a world of chaos? I don't know. It's God. It, it, it's not understandable. We will never be able to explain to someone the fullness of the peace we have without them having the peace of God inside of them themselves. They'll never understand it. They'll never be able to wrap their little minds around it because we can't even explain it. No one will ever understand that peace that comes from Jesus unless they themselves experience the full gospel. Unless they get the full conversion. This whole, will I believe on Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that doesn't do it. You have to be filled with His Spirit in order to have His peace inside of you. Otherwise, it's what? Fabricated peace, right? Again, I'm still talking about spiritual warfare. 
The enemy tries to get you shook. He tries to get you to where you're not peaceful because if you're worried all the time, then he knows that he can defeat you because you're going to scamper away from what you know is true. He's going to get you to second guess yourself. If you think of it this way, whenever you have your feet shod with the gospel of peace, then nothing can sway you because you know that God is there. You know he's protecting you. You know that God is going to take care of you and that your answer is on the way. You know it. He even tells you, all, he tells you the birds, they, what, the birds they don't sow nor do they gather or whatever. I forget the exact quote of the scripture, but he says all these things, they don't do nothing, but yet they're still taken care of. How much more shall the father take care of you who are his children? So he lets you know if your son comes up to you, gives, asks for bread, are you to give him a serpent or a scorpion? No. So how much more do you think your father in heaven is going to bless you? So if you understand that, then peace will come over you because you may look at things and they may be going crazy, which the world is right now. But we can stand in peace knowing that God is in control of it all. You will be like Jesus sleeping on the ship as the disciples panic over the storm. Jesus knew the ship wasn't going to sink because for one, he was on it. And for two, their ministry wasn't over yet. He was sleeping on the ship and they're like, oh, let's go wake the master because Lord, don't you care that we're about to perish? And Jesus like, don't you know I'm on the boat? Don't you know that you're my 12 disciples and that we have a, a ministry to perform? You can, you'll almost be like Paul. Paul wasn't scared of death because he's like, hey, I know I'm going to Rome. And until I get to Rome, my ministry is not fulfilled. So he's like, my ministry is not fulfilled until I get there. So as long as I'm not at Rome yet, I'm okay. I can live. I can do what I need to do. And God's going to provide for me and take care of me until the end of my road is there. So whenever this world and the ship of this world seem like it's about to go down and the world is burning all around us, in some places literally, and everything seems to be going crazy, we look at it and we can stand at peace knowing that God is in control because He's on our boat with us and He's not going to let us go down. So we're able to stand in peace knowing that He is going to take care of us. Whenever you know that God is on your side, you can walk through the fiery furnace like the three Hebrew boys without a care in the world and people won't be able to understand it. Wasn't there three that we threw in the fire, but yet I see four, one of which looks like the Son of God? King Nebuchadnezzar couldn't understand how the three Hebrew boys were like, well, okay, throw us in because either we're going to perish or we're not. Let's see. They were at peace with the fact that either they were going to die or they were going to be brought through it. They were at peace knowing that God was there no matter what was going on. The king couldn't understand it. Turn it up seven times harder than we've ever done it. He was trying to get them worried and shook because he realized that if they didn't have peace in the middle of the storm, that they would most likely perish. But they didn't care. You'll be, as Paul said, to live as Christ, but to die is to gain. You are not concerned. If I die tonight, there's a greater thing waiting for me up there. I'll be waiting for the trumpet to sound, and I'll meet you in the sky. If not, then that's okay, because I'm still living to do what Christ has called me to do. I'm still being a minister of Christ, and in that I have peace. To live is to Christ, and to die is to gain. So now that we have on our belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and we just put on these shoes of the gospel of peace, we're there, right? We're able to stand. We're able to do what we need to do. We have on these three permanent pieces of armor. And the reason I say permanent is because these three items are things that you wear and not just carry. When you, when you look at a soldier or someone in the military, there's things that we have on at all times. We, have our, we they had our, cat, our camouflage stuff on. We had our boots on. And we'd always have a rifle with us. We always had something. That's what it was. And this is what it is. The armor of God, the breastplate, the belt, and the shoes never left 
when they were on the battlefield. It was always on them. But the next three items that we're about to touch one of them were not on the body at all times. But it was something that they would carry with them into battle. It was something that they would pick up and carry when it was necessary. Now, am I saying that these items are to be laid down? No, of course not. But what I'm saying is that these next three items are items that are tools to be used in the battle of spiritual warfare. Like I said, we have the belt of truth. We got the breastplate of righteousness and we have our shoes to hold us and to stand strong. And the next ones are just tools that are used within spiritual warfare. The shield of faith is one of these tools because you don't go into battle and have your shield there at all times. You're, you're not just cowering behind your shield the whole time you're in, in battle. You're not just hiding behind it. It's there for when the darts come. Because it says that it's there for when all the fiery darts of the enemy come at you. So the shield of faith is used when you're under attack. You put the shield out, you hide behind it, and you protect yourself from the enemy that's coming at you. So the shield is something you use when you're directly under attack. And that's why it's faith. Whenever you see a movie or if you've seen a picture of Roman soldiers or, or whatever you want, you know that when the enemy is coming at them, they put the shields up. They protect themselves. But whenever it was time to attack, they would pull the shield aside and they would lunge forward with whatever the spear, the sword, the arrow, whatever they would have, they would have to move the shield in order to attack. So the shield is not necessarily a permanent fixture that stays in place at all times. If you think of it this way, faith is best used whenever we are under attack or when the adversary is trying to advance. Faith is important to have at all times. But whenever things are going your way and there are not many problems happening, your faith isn't being engaged. I mean, if you're living high on the hog, then you ain't worried about it. If you got two grand in your bank account, you're not worried about losing your money and being broke. If you got a brand new car with new tires and just got service and all, you're not worried about your car breaking down. So why would you need faith at that moment because everything is going good? Everything is riding smooth, man. You got it. It's just moving along for you. You're happy. Everything is going. That's why Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So if you already have what you hope for, and the things you have prayed for, then faith isn't your key tool at that moment, is what I'm trying to get at this evening. You don't need faith if you got money. You don't need faith if you got a full tank of gas to get to church. You're good. You can make it. You know you can. I'm like, okay, I can go home. I can do this. I can even stop on my way to home to get something to eat. I can even go to work tomorrow. I don't have to worry about getting gas. So your faith is not necessarily engaged at that time. That's why the scripture says, take up the shield of faith that quenches the fiery darts of the enemy. Faith is best engaged and used whenever we are being shot at by the enemy because it's only faith that's going to get us through the circumstances. Faith is acting on the truth. So faith is acting on the belt of truth. Despite what I feel, or see at this very moment, if truth is, remember, the belt of which we must put on first, because everything depends on it, tells me that everything is going to work out for me, then I have to trust that it will. That's faith. I'm staring right at the enemy. He's coming right at me. But God tells me that though the gates of hell will come up against, it's not going to prevail against the church. So I know that it's coming here. I know that the weapons of the enemy are formed against me, but the Bible tells me, the truth tells me that it's not going to prevail against me. So I'm able to use the shield of faith to stand up against it and say, no, I'm going to win this thing. And that's faith. You don't see your way out. You don't see the sun rising. You don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You don't know when your storm is going to be over. That is faith because you don't see it yet. That is what real faith is. 
It's not throwing your hands up and saying, well, everything right now is against me, so I guess I lose. I'm just going to throw in the towel and quit. No, faith is saying that the Word of God says this, so that's what I'm going to hold on to. Faith is saying, even though everything is against me right now, God says that everything works for the good of those that love Him or called according to His purpose. So I know it may be my darkest hour right now, but for some reason, the purpose behind this is going to work out for my good. So I'm going to keep my shield up and I'm going to fight and I'm going to hold my ground because I know that God says so. So I may not see it right now, but I'm going to hold true to it because that is what faith is. That is what faith is. See, the thing that we get wrong so many times is that faith isn't what makes God move. Faith is the belief that God has already moved and we are going to receive what that is. Faith isn't what makes Him move. He's already moved. I told you, God is what? The same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So He's already at the end. He's omnipresent. He's not controlled by time nor space. He is everywhere at all times. So that means He's already in the future. So faith is not telling God, okay, now you can give me my answer. Faith is saying, okay, God, I know you're going to give me my answer, so I'm going to believe that it's coming. That's faith. That's what faith is. Faith is to believe that God has already moved. Faith doesn't make God answer our prayers, but faith is knowing that God has already answered them. That's why the Bible says what? To give thanks in everything. In everything, give thanks. We come to Him with our prayers through, through thanksgiving and through supplication. So we go to Him in prayer with thanksgiving. So you go to him saying, Lord, thank you for answering my prayers. Now, here's the prayers that I've been praying to you that I know that you're answering because I'm already giving you thanks for the things I'm about to pray for, knowing that you're going to answer them because I have faith to believe that they're going to come to me. That's faith. That's why it's hard sometimes for humans to understand this. The reason so many of us struggle with faith is because it goes against all of our five senses. It goes against our five senses as humanities. You can't see, feel, taste, touch, or smell faith. It's not there. You can't reach out and grab it. You can't see it. You can't feel it coming. It's just faith. It goes against all human senses. We as humans base everything off five senses. And if we can sense it, then it's not true to us. If we can't feel it, taste it, smell it, touch it, Whatever, it's not true. It's not really there. But truth is just the, our faith is just the opposite of that. But remember, the belt of truth is what we as believers base our truth on. So if God says it, that means it's true to us. If God says it, it's true to us. So we have to take our five senses and throw them out the door and say, okay, you know what? I'm not basing it on that. I'm basing it upon what the Word of God says. Because that's where my faith hinges is the truth of God. Faith is seriously looking the facts in the face and saying, I don't believe this. Because I can tell you, you can have all the facts, but it don't mean you got all the truth. Because facts is what people want to tell you. Facts is what they want you to believe. But the facts ain't always the truth. Because if the facts go against the word of God, then the facts ain't true. So we got to look at it from that perspective. Don't think, well, I got all the facts, so I'm good. No. Don't believe the facts. Believe what the truth says. And what does the truth say? The Bible says a lot of things. It says that I believe what the truth says. Faith is saying, whose report do you believe? Which report? Do you believe the doctor when they say that you can't be cured? Do you believe the counselor whenever they say addiction is a sickness? Do you believe that your loved ones can't be saved? Faith is hearing all of that and then remembering what the Word of God says and knowing that it's by His stripes we are healed. It's saying that the doctors may say it's impossible. This can't happen. But you go back and say, wait. 
The Bible says that all things are possible through, through Christ. He makes the impossible possible. There's nothing too hard for God. That, that's what the Word of God says. So let me reach to my belt of truth real quick. Look at it and know that it is possible and that I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. Because faith is not based upon senses, but faith is based upon the Word of God and what we believe. Faith is looking at your bank account when the negative balance is still going to church because you know that God will provide for you. Faith is saying, you know what, I may not be able to make ends meet at the end of the month, but hey, God, you're going to provide food for my family, so I'm just going to keep doing what I know to do. It's maybe my last $100, but you know what, that's the tithe I need to pay, so I'm going to pay that to you, God, and let you take care of the rest. That is faith. Because you are not allowing your senses, your human reasoning to work through you, but you're allowing God to work through you, even though the fiery darts are coming, even though the enemy is advancing, you pull out your shield of faith and you stand against it and you say, no, devil, God is greater than you. And I'm going to stand firm because after the darts pierce my shield and the fire is gone, I can now move it and I'll begin to attack you at that moment. It also says that we have power to set people free from their bondage. Faith is like I said, going against all five senses and logic. People just don't understand. They, they cannot perceive what faith is. They, they just don't, they can't wrap their head around it because it goes against what they think. Wait, why are you giving your last dollar to the church when you ain't got nothing? Well, because God's going to provide. Well, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Well, I don't know, because God's going to provide. God's going to take care of me. He said, I'm always going to be taken care of. I'll always have food on my table. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto me. So as long as I'm seeking God and His righteousness, as long as I'm hungering and thirsting after Him, as long as I'm doing everything I know to do, I'm going to stand here, put my shield up, and say, okay, enemy, come at me, because I know God is going to provide for me. That is what faith is. No one can have faith without having truth first. Because without truth, you won't know that these things are possible. Without knowing the Word of God and knowing Christ on a personal level, nothing of this is possible to you. Because you will never know it. That's why people who have never experienced God don't understand why we are the way we are. They call us what? Peculiar, crazy, weird. They are just not normal people. You're right, we're not. Because I don't base myself on the world, but I base myself on God. And if God says it, then it's true. No matter what the world tells me. No matter what the world tells me, if it goes against what the Word says, it's not true. And I'm not going to hold to it. But I'm going to stand firm upon the Word of God. So yes, we have our belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. We got our feet firmly planted because we have peace now around our feet and we're able to stand. And now we have the shield of faith in front of us. So when the fiery darts come, we know that God is protecting us and being there for us. And like I said, next week we'll be going into the other lessons and we'll be diving into the... Um, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit.